Moment. A, A definition. definition. On November 14, 1998, the members of the Tectonic Theater Project traveled to Laramie, Wyoming and conducted interviews with the people of the town. During the next year, we would return to Laramie several times and conduct over 200 interviews. The play you are about to see is edited from those interviews, as well as from the journal entries by the members of the company and other found texts. Company member Greg Perotti. My first interview was with Detective Sergeant Ping of the Laramie Police Department. At the start of the interview, he was sitting behind his desk, sitting something like this. I was born and raised here. My family is a third generation. It's a good place to live. Good people. Lots of space. There's so much space between people and towns here. So much time for reflection. Rebecca Hilker, head of the theater department at the University of Wyoming. I found that people here were nicer than in the Midwest, where I used to teach, because they were happy. I love it here. Doc O'Connor, limousine driver. They say the Wyoming wind will drive a man insane. But you know what? It don't bother me. Well, sometimes it bothers me, but most of the time it don't. I moved here after living in a couple of big cities. Philip Dupont, president of the University of Wyoming. I loved it there. But you'd have to be out of your mind to let your kids play out after dark. And here, in the summertime, my kids play out till 11 o'clock, and I don't think twice about it. I like the trains, too. <laughs> they don't bother me. Well, sometimes they bother me. <laughs> but most of the time they don't. Now, when the incident happened with that boy, a lot of press people came here. And this one reporter, uh, lady person that was there, she said, Well, who found the boy? Who was after anyway? And I said, Well, it's a really popular area for people to run, and mountain biking is really big out here, horseback riding. It's just, well, just close to the town. And she looked at me and she said, Who would want to run out here? And I'm thinking, lady, you're just missing the whole point. You know, all you gotta do is turn around, see the mountains, smell the air, listen to the birds, just take in what's around you. They're just, they're just missing the whole point. It's hard to talk about Laramie now, to tell you what Laramie is for us. Jedediah Schultz, student at the university. And if you would have asked me before, I would have told you, Laramie is a beautiful town. It's secluded enough that you can have your own identity. But now, after Matthew, I would say Laramie is a town defined by an accident, a crime. We've become Waco. We've become Jasper. We're a noun, a sign, a definition. We may be able to change that, but it will sure take a while. Moment. Journal, Journal entries. Company member Greg Parati. We arrived today in the Denver airport and drove to Laramie. The moment we crossed the Wyoming border, I swear I saw a herd of buffalo. Company member Moises Kaufman. Today, the company tried to explain to me, to no avail, what chicken fried steak was. <laughs> company member Barbara Pitts. We arrived in Laramie tonight, just past the Welcome to Laramie sign, population 26,687. The first thing to greet us is Walmart. In the dark, we could have been on any main stretch in America. Fast food chains, gas stations, but as we pass the University Inn on the sign where amenities such as heated pool or cable TV are usually touted, it said, hate is not a Laramie value. Moment. Matthew. Company member Andy Paris. Today, for the first time, we met someone who actually knew Matthew Shepard. Trish Steger, owner of a shop in town, referred to him as Matt. Matt used to come into my shop. That's how I know him. It was the first time I heard him referred to as Matt instead of Matthew. Did he go by Matt? <coughs> so I get a phone call about uh, 10 after 7. Doc O'Connor. It was Matthew Shepard, and he said, can you pick me up on the corner of 3rd and Grand? So he walks up to the window, and I say, are you Matthew Shepard? And he said, yeah, I'm Matthew Shepard, but I want you to call me Matthew or Mr. Shepard. My name is Matt, and I want you to know I'm gay, and we're going to a gay bar. Do you have a problem with that? And I said, how do you paint? I liked him, because he was straightforward. 
You see what I'm saying? Maybe gay, but straight forward. You see what I'm saying? I don't know, you know. How does any one person ever tell about another? You really should talk to my sister Romaine. She was a very close friend of Matthew's. Whenever I think of Matthew, I always think of his incredible beaming smile. I mean, he'd walk in and he'd just be like, you know, he'd smile at everyone. He just made you feel great. Matthew was very shy when he first came here. John Peacock, Matthew Shepard's academic advisor. He was just figuring out what he work on human rights, how he was going to do that which only adds to the irony and tragedy of this whole thing. Moment. The word. Ah, uh, the sociology of religion in the West. Stephen Mead Johnson, Unitarian minister. Dominant religious traditions in this town. Baptist, Mormon. So the spectrum would be, on the left side of the panel, so far left that I'm probably sitting by myself, is me and the Unitarian church. Unitarians are by and large humanists, many of whom are atheists. I mean, we're not even sure we're a religion. And to my right on the panel, to his credit, Father Roger, Catholic priest. And God bless him, he did not equivocate at all when this happened. He hosted the vigil for Matthew that night. I was really jolted because, you know, when we did the vigil, we wanted to get other ministers involved. So we called some of them. And they weren't going to get involved. And it was like, we're going to stand back, wait, see which way the wind is blowing. And that angered me immensely. <laughs> We are supposed to stand out as leaders. I thought, wow, what's going on here? God has set boundaries. Doug Laws, state ecclesiastical leader for the Mormon church. There's a proclamation that came out on the family. <coughs> the family is defined as one woman, one man, and children. That's a family. That's about as clear as you can state it. The Christian pastors, many of the conservative ones, were silent on this. Moment. The fireside. Today I went to the Fireside Bar, which is the last place Matthew was seen in public. So what can I tell you about Matthew? If you had a hundred customers like him, it'd be the, the most perfect bar I've ever been in, okay? Manners, politeness, intelligence, taking care of me, as in tips. Everything. Conversation, uh, dress nice, clean cut. So he kicked it there. Didn't seem to have any worries or like he was looking for anyone. Now approximately 11.45, 11.30, 11.45, Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson come in. I didn't know their names then, but they're the accused. They walk in just very stone-faced, you know, dirty, grungy, rude, paying for a picture of dimes and quarters. That's a nightmare. They took the picture back there with them to the pool room and kept it themselves. Next thing I know, they're just kind of walking around. Then a few moments later, they're talking to Matthew Shepard. Aaron said that a guy walked up to him and told him that he was gay and wanted to get with Aaron and Russ. Kristen Price, girlfriend of Aaron McKinney, and that he got aggravated with it and told him that he was straight and didn't want anything to do with him. He said that is when he and Russell went to the bathroom and decided to pretend that they were gay and get him in the truck and rob him. Okay, no. They say that Matt approached them, that he came onto them. I absolutely disbelieve and refute that statement. 100%. Refute it. I'm going to give you two reasons why. One, character reference. Why would he approach them? Why them? He wasn't approaching anybody else. Two, territorialism is, is, is the word I would use for this. And that's the fact that Matt was sitting there. Aaron and Russell were in the pool area. Upon their first interaction, they're in Matt's area, in the area Matt had been seen in all night. So who approached you by that? Matthew was the kind of person, like he never had any problem just striking up a conversation with anybody. The fact that Matt was at the bar alone, without any friends, made him that much more vulnerable. So, basically, what I'm testifying to is that I saw Matthew leave. I saw two individuals leave with Matthew. I didn't see their faces, but I saw the backs of their heads. At the same time, McKinney and Henderson were no longer around. You do the math. Moment! McKinney, McKinney and Henderson. Henderson. A friend of Aaron McKinney. Oh, I've known Aaron a long time. Aaron was a good kid. I liked Aaron a lot. That's how I was shocked when I heard this. At the time I knew him, he was just a young kid, trying to, you know, he just wanted to fit in, you know? Acting tough, acting cool, but, you know, you get his face about it. He backed down like he was some sort of scared kid. Sherry Aginson, Russell was just so sweet, you know? He was the one that was the Eagle Scout. Now, I just want to shake him, you know? What were you thinking? What were you thinking? Moment. Finding Matthew Shepard. <laughs> Eric Rifles, the boy who found Matthew at the fence. I, uh, I 
I took off on my bicycle at about 5 o'clock p.m. on Wednesday from my dorm. I just kind of felt like going for a ride. So, and yeah, on my way back down, I didn't know where I was going. I was just sort of picking the way to go, which now, it makes me think that God wanted me to find him because there's no way I was going to go that way. So uh, I went along, and there's this rock on the, on the ground, and I just drilled it. I went over the handlebars and ended up on the ground. So uh, I got up, and I was kind of dusting myself off, and I was looking around when I noticed something, which, which ended up to be Matt, and he was just lying there by the fence. And uh, as I got closer to him, I noticed, I noticed his hair, which was a major key to me noticing, noticing it was a human being. So I ran to the nearest house and ran as fast as I could and called the police. I responded to the call. Officer Reggie Flutie. I did the best I could. The gentleman that was lying on the ground, Matthew Shepard, was covered in dried blood. There was dried blood beneath him, and he was barely breathing. He was doing the best he could. The only place where it appeared there was no dried blood was where it appeared he had been crying on his face. I was working the emergency room the night Matthew Shepard was brought in. You expect to see these kind of injuries from a car going down a hill at 80 miles an hour. But you don't expect to see that from someone doing this to another person. He was tied to the fence, and his shoes were missing. He was tied extremely tight, so I had to use my boot knife and try and slip it between the rope and his wrist. I had to be extremely careful not to harm Matthew any further. Whenever there's been someone that's been beaten repeatedly, certainly this is something that offends us. I think that's a good word. It offends us. I was finally able to get my knife in there. It, we rolled him to his left side and he immediately stopped breathing. So we put him back on his back and that was just enough of an adjustment that I was able to cut him free there. Moment. The essential facts. Our focus today turns to Laramie, Wyoming, and the Albany County Courthouse, where Aaron James McKinney and Russell Arthur Henderson are being charged with the brutal beating of Matthew Shepard, a gay University of Wyoming student. The essential facts are that the defendants, Aaron James McKinney and Russell Arthur Henderson, met Matthew Shepard at the Fireside Bar. After Mr. Shepard confided he was gay, the defendants deceived Mr. Shepard into leaving with them in their vehicle to a remote area. After arrival at said area, the defendants tied their victim to a buck fence, beat him, robbed him, and tortured him. I don't think there was a single person left in that courtroom who wasn't crying. I mean, it lasted five minutes, but it kept getting more and more horrific, ending with said defendants left the victim begging for his life. Moment! The Gem City of the Plains! Laramie, Wyoming, often called the Gem City of the Plains, is now at the center of the storm. Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson came from the poor side of town. As a gay college student lay hospitalized in critical condition after severe beating. People would think that what happened to Matthew was an exception to the rule, but it was an extreme version of what happens. It's a tough business, as Matthew Shepard knew, and as his friends all know, to be gay in cowboy country. Wyoming Governor Jim Garrigan, a first term Republican, up for re-election. I am outraged and sickened by the heinous crime committed against Matthew Shepard. I extend my most heartfelt sympathies to the family. Governor, you haven't pushed for hate crime legislation in the past. I'd like to urge the people of Wyoming against overreacting in a way that gives one group special rights over others. We will wait and see if the vicious beating and torture of Matthew Shepard was motivated by hate. Bill McKinney, father of one of the accused. Had this been a heterosexual of these two boys decided to take out and rob, it would have never made national news. Now my son is guilty before he has even had a trial. Moment. Medical update. Matthew Shepard. Medical update. 3 p.m. Saturday, October 10th. Matthew Shepard was admitted in critical condition approximately 9.15 p.m. October 7th. 
When he arrived, he was unresponsive and breathing support was being provided. Matthew's major injuries upon arrival consisted of hypothermia and a fracture from behind the head to just in front of the right ear. There were also several lacerations to his head, neck, and face. Matthew's parents arrived 7 p.m. October 9th and are now at his bedside. Both Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson have pled not guilty to charges. Their girlfriends, Jacity Paisley and Christian Price, have also pled not guilty after being charged as accessories after the fact. Moment. Live and let live. There are certain things when I sit in church. Jedediah Schultz. And the Reverend will tell you flat out that he doesn't agree with homosexuality. And you know, I'm still changing. I'm still learning about myself. And I don't feel I know enough about certain things to make the, the decision that says homosexuality is right when you've been raised your entire life that it's wrong. But I don't hate homosexuals. I mean, I'm not going to persecute them or anything like that. I mean, that's not going to be getting in the way between me and the other person at all. Well, there's this whole idea. You leave me alone, I leave you alone. Jonas Slodeker. And it's even in some Western literature. Live and let live. That is such garbage. I tell my friends, even my gay friends bring it up sometimes, and I'm like, that is such garbage, you know? I mean, basically, what it boils down to is, if I don't tell you I'm gay, you won't beat me up. What's so great about that? That's a great philosophy? Moment! It, it happened here. We went to the candlelight vigil. Zubayah Ula, university student. We have to mourn this, and we have to be sad that we live in a town, a state, a country where things like this happen. There are people trying to distance themselves from this crime, but we need to own it. I feel everyone needs to own it. We are like this. We are like this. We are like this. Moment. What of ours? I really haven't been all that involved, per se. I mean, my husband's a highway patrolman, so that's really the only way I've known about it. Now, when I first found out, I thought it was just horrible. I mean, nobody deserves that. I don't care who you are. But the other thing that was not brought out, at the same time that happened, that patrolman was killed. And there was nothing. Nothing. They didn't say anything about the old man that killed him. He was driving down the road, and he shouldn't have been driving and killed him. It was just this little piece in the paper, and we lost one of our guys. What's the difference if you're gay? A hate crime is a hate crime. If you murder somebody, you hate them. I don't understand. I don't understand. Moment. Violence. You think violence is what they did to Matthew. And they did do violence to Matthew. But you know, every time you're called a queer, or a les, or whatever, do you realize that is violence? That is the seed of violence, and I would resent it immensely if you use anything I said to, to somehow cultivate that kind of violence, even in its smallest form. I would resent it immensely. You need to know that. Thank you, Father, for saying that. Just deal with what is true. You know what is true. You need to do your best to say it correct. Moment. Medical update. Matthew Shepard, medical update for 4.30 a.m. Monday, October 12th. At 12 midnight on Monday, October 12th, Matthew Shepard's blood pressure began to drop. We immediately notified the family who were already at the hospital. At 12.53 a.m., Matthew Shepard died. His family was at his bedside. Matthew's parents would like me to express their sincerest gratitude to the entire world for the overwhelming response for their son. The family was grateful that they did not have to make a decision regarding whether or not to continue life support for their son. Like a good son, he was caring to the end and removed guilt or stress from the family. Matthew's parents said, go home, give your kids a hug, and don't let a day go by without telling them that you love them. <laughs> Moment. H-O-P-E. -E. I'll tell you what. If they put those two boys to death, that would defeat everything Matt would be thinking about them. Because Matt won't want those two boys to die. He'd want them to leave with hope. 
H-O-P-E. Just like the whole world hoped that Matt would survive. The whole thing, you see, the whole thing ropes around hope. H-O-P-E. Moment. Snow. The day of the funeral, it was snowing so bad. My most striking memory of From the Funeral? Gary Drake, Casper Star Tribune. Was that Fred felt seeing go up in the park? Do you believe the Bible? You stand over there, ignorant of the fact that the Bible, for every verse, it talks about God's love. It talks about God's hate. Some high school kids came over and started yelling at the Fred Phelps people. And across the street, you had people lined up for the funeral. Well, I remember this skinhead coming over, and I just thought, oh. This is going to be a real ugly confrontation, but instead, he started leading them in amazing grace. You amazing don't think that part of the Bible, that perfect attribute of God, cry out, uplift thy voice, and show my people their transgressions. This is an excerpt from a statement made to the court by Lucy Thompson. As the grandmother and person who raised Russell, along with our family, we have written the following statement. Our hearts ache for the pain and suffering that the shepherds have went through. We have prayed for your family since the very beginning. And you will continue to be in our prayers, for we know your pain will never truly go away. For the Russell we know and love, we humbly plead your honor to not take him out of our lives forever. Thank you. Mr. Henderson, do you have anything that you would like to say? Yes, I would, Your Honor. Mr. and Mrs. Shepherd, there is not a moment that goes by, that I don't see what happens that night. I know what I do is very wrong, and I'm very sorry for what I did. You have my greatest sympathy for what happened. I hope that, one day, you'll be able to find in your hearts to forgive me for what I've done. Your Honor, I know what I did was very wrong, and I'm very sorry for what I did, and I'm ready to pay my debt for what I did. Mr. Henderson, you drove the vehicle that took Matthew Shepard to his death. You bound him to that fence in order that he might not escape and in order that he might be more savagely beaten. You left him out there for 18 hours, knowing full well he was there, perhaps having the opportunity to save his life, and you did nothing. The court finds it appropriate that sentencing be as follows. As to count three, that being felony murder with robbery, that you are to serve a period of imprisonment for the term of your natural life. As to count one, that being kidnapping, that you are to serve a period of imprisonment for the term of your natural life. Sentencing for count one to run consecutive to sentencing for count three. No! Moment. A death penalty case. Almost a year to the day that Matthew Shepard died, the trial for Aaron James McKinney was set to begin. Oh, I believe in the death penalty 100%, you know? Because I want to make sure that guy dies. This is one instance where I truly believe with all my heart, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I don't know about the death penalty, but I don't ever want to see them ever walk out of the Rollins Penitentiary. I'll pay my nickel, or whatever, my little percentage of tax, just to make sure that he stays in there and never sees society again. I don't believe that one person should be killed for redemption for his having killed another. Two wrongs don't make a right. How can I protest if the shepherds want McKinney dead? I can't interfere on that. But on a personal level, I knew Aaron in grade school. Back then, he didn't go by Aaron, he went by AJ. How can we put AJ McKinney to death? I think, right now, our most <coughs> important teachers must be Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney. They have to be our teachers. How did you learn? What did we as a society do to teach you that? I think it would be wonderful if the judge said, in addition to your sentence, you must tell your story. You must tell your story. Moment. Eric McKinney. During the trial of Eric McKinney, the 
prosecution played a tape recording of his confession. My name is Rob Debris, sergeant for the sheriff's office. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and may be used against you in the court of law. This is an excerpt from that confession. Did he ever try to hit you or defend yourself? <clears throat> yeah, sort of. He tries little swings or whatever, but it wasn't very effective. Okay. How many times did you guys hit him inside the truck before you stopped where you left him? I'd say I hit him two or three times. Probably three times with the fist, about six times with the pistol. Did he ask you to stop? Well, yeah. What did he say? After he asked me to stop, most all he was doing was screaming. So, Russ kind of dragged him over, I'm assuming, and tied him up? I guess. I just remember Russ was laughing at first, but then he got pretty scared. So, obviously, you don't like gay people. No, I don't. Would you say you hate them? Uh, I really don't hate them, you know. When they start coming on me and stuff like that, I get pretty aggravated. Can you answer me one thing? Why'd you guys take his shoes? I don't know. Now I'll never get to see my son again. I don't know. So what are they going to give me? 25 to life or the death penalty? And get it over with. Moment. The no verdict. As to the charge of kidnapping, we find the defendant, Eric James McKinney, guilty. As to the charge of aggravated robbery, we find the defendant, Eric James McKinney, guilty. As to the charge of first degree felony murder, kidnapping, we find the defendant, Eric James McKinney, guilty. Moment. Dennis Shepard's statement. On October 12th, 1998, my firstborn son and my hero died 50 days before his 22nd birthday. Matt's beating, hospitalization, and funeral focus worldwide attention on hate. Good is coming out of evil. People have said enough is enough. I miss my son, but I am proud to be able to say that he was my son. I would like nothing better than to see you die, Mr. McKinney. However, this is a time to begin the healing process, to show mercy to someone who has refused to show any mercy. Mr. McKinney, I'm going to grant you life as hard as it is for me to do so, because of Matthew. You robbed me of something very precious, and I will never forgive you for that. Mr. McKinney, I give you life in the memory of one who no longer lives. May you have a long life, and may you thank Matthew every day for it. Moment. Epilogue. This is Jonas Sloanaker. Change is not an easy thing. And I don't think the people were up to it here. You know, it's been a year since Matthew Shepard died. And they haven't passed anything in Wyoming. At the state level, any town, nobody, anywhere, has passed any sort of laws, anti-discrimination laws, or hate crime legislation. What's come out of this? What's come out of this that's concrete or lasting. We all said we would meet one last time at the fence. The night he and I drove together, he said to me, Laramie sparkles, doesn't it? And you said exactly where he was up there? If you said exactly where he was up there? Laramie sparkles from there. The last thing he saw on this earth was the sparkling lights. <laughs>